Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We have arrived at Isaiah chapter 57. The opening couple of verses are going to speak to the loss of the righteous, those who worshiped Yahweh faithfully. And then it's going to set the tone for this just outright blasting of those who practice pagan worship. There are going to be some uh, some references to like the Wadi, for example, this is the Hebrew word for river. You're going to see some more poetic references to some pagan practices. Oftentimes, pagan worship is really just lust disguised as pagan worship. It's it's described as worship. It seems like, hey, if I go and partake of the services offered by this uh, temple prostitute, I'll be doing something righteous. It's a win-win for me. That That's often how it goes. Pagan worship is often cloaked in lust. It, this is a tactic the enemy has been using for millennia, for thousands of years. And so given the choice between repenting of sexual sin and following God or partaking of, of lustful activities and seemingly being righteous with some other God, really it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a swayed sense of judgment in, the, in the, the, the lustful man's heart where he would pursue pagan worship really just because his lusts demand it. The righteous person perishes and no one takes it to heart. The faithful are taken away with no one realizing that the righteous person is taken away because of evil. Have you ever been to a funeral and you've thought, man, this is way too soon. This person passed away way too soon. They were way too young. And then were you just astounded at the gall, the callousness of the world to just keep on spinning after they're gone? Like, don't you guys know? that, that a, a righteous person died? Don't you even care? That's sort of what this verse evokes. The righteous person perishes and no one takes it to heart. The faithful are taken away. And then here's the explanation. With no one realizing that the righteous person is taken away because of evil, we live in a fallen, sin-stained world. I've done funerals for multiple teenagers over the years and stuff just goes wrong. Cancer happens. It's all symptomatic of the fallout of original sin. And this sin-stained world is not perfect, and we yearn for the perfection of heaven, and yet evil has its way sometimes. This also weighs in on the global missions front. When you look at the amalgamation of data from the Lausanne Conference, the Joshua Project, and the International Mission Board, you can see certain countries whose borders are outlined in bright red, indicating a lack of uh, Christian presence there. And it begs the question, why? Why is Christianity conspicuously absent from these countries? Well, many of those countries whose borders turn out bright red on the global status of evangelical Christianity report killed missionaries who were sent to them. Okay, we did send missionaries. They were trained. They were well-funded. They, In most, most cases, they did go about everything the right way, and yet they were martyred. They were murdered. If you kill all the missionaries, there won't be any missionaries there. And so that's the reason why certain countries are bright red on that report, because they killed the missionaries we sent there. No one realizes that the righteous person is taken away because of evil. Now look at this. This is a beautiful promise for the righteous one. He will enter into peace. They will rest on their beds. Everyone who lives uprightly. Now this is a beautiful thought. It seems just to us. As New Testament believers, we must also remember, however, this is an Old Testament text, and there's no one righteous, not even one, right? That we all stand and fall short of the glory of God. Our righteousness uh, is like filthy rags before God, Isaiah has written, as we've seen in this study. And so this is speaking to Old Testament peoples who exhibited righteousness by way of adherence to the law of Moses. The man who does these things will live by them. That's how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 10. And so now righteousness comes by faith. This is by grace alone, in Christ alone. This righteousness is near you in your heart and in your mouth. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the New Testament believer is the one who confesses that Jesus is Lord, and because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling repents from sin. In the Old Testament, however, you are the one who lived uprightly, meaning you adhere to the law of Moses. So these opening two verses speak to the tragic loss of the righteous, and then that sets the tone for what follows. But come here, you witches' sons, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Who are you mocking? Who are you opening your mouth and sticking your tongue at? 
sticking out your tongue at? Isn't, you, isn't it you, you rebellious children, you offspring of liars? And look, here is going to describe some of the pagan practices. Who burn with lust among the oaks under every green tree, who slaughter children in the wadis. Remember, this is the Hebrew word for river. Below the clefts of the rocks. Your portion is among the smooth stones of the wadi. Indeed, they are your lot. You have even poured out a drink offering to them. You have offered a grain offering. Should I be satisfied with these? And so this is poetic imagery describing the fulfillment of pagan lustful acts. Uh, really, it was prostitution, but it was packaged like it was idol worship. And now God is telling them, look, this is your portion. Okay, you think of it like this way. You, 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 you made your bed, now you have to lie in it. Your portion is among the smooth stones of the wadi. All right, look, see, you slaughtered your children in the wadi, and now that's where your portion is. Indeed, they are your lot. Okay, this is, this is the side that you've chosen. You have placed your bed on a high and lofty mountain. You also went up there to offer sacrifice. You have set up your memorial behind the door and doorpost. For away from me, you stripped, went up, and made your bed wide. And you have made a bargain for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have gazed on their genitals. You went to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far away and sent them down even to Sheol. You became weary on your many journeys, but you did not say, it's hopeless. You found a renewal of your strength. Therefore, you did not grow weak. Who was it you dreaded and feared so that you lied and didn't remember me or take it to heart? I have kept silent for a long time, haven't I? So you do not fear me. I will announce your righteousness and your works. They will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols rescue you. The wind will carry all of them off. A breath will take them away. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. So similar to Ezekiel, Isaiah has used shocking language here, but it is not nearly as shocking as the acts themselves were. In fact, this is very coothful language compared to what could have been. I think about the movie Unplanned uh, that describes the story of a former manager of a Planned Parenthood abortion clinic who then saw an abortion take place on ultrasound, had a massive change of heart and uh, repented of her sin. Her story is in the movie Unplanned. That movie opens up with uh, a brief sequence, CGI, showing an abortion taking place on uh, an ultrasound screen, but it's it's manufactured, it's, it's artifice, and it's shocking. But here's the thing, it's not nearly as shocking as the real thing. It is rightly surprising. This is similar to, this is similar to what Isaiah is doing here. He is, he is naming some of the sins that take place, but he is stopping drastically short of where he could have gone. He's not giving less of his detail, uh, but he is driving home the fact that you have sacrificed children, you have committed acts of lust, you have you have chosen your side, and it's th- this. Look, he even said you have placed your bed on a high and lofty mountain. Okay, like literally our our modern day colloquialism. You made your bed, now lie in it. This is the, it, it could could be borrowed slightly from Isaiah 57, verse 7. All right, so he, he goes on to just name some of the things that they've done. Look, you've loved this. You chose this, okay? For, uh, for away from me, you stripped, you went up, you made your bed wide. You made a bargain for yourself with them. I think about modern-day Christians who either acquiesce to uh, modern day, the modern-day sexual revolution um, or approve of it, all right? In Romans chapter 1, Paul, in the final words of that chapter, where it leaves absolutely zero doubt whatsoever at all that the text is talking about, the rampant homosexuality of Sodom and Gomorrah as an archetype for what is repeated over and over again when we abandon the truth of God for a lie. We suppress the truth that we know about God, and we just want to get away with sin. It's all we really want to do. And this has happened over and over again, culture after culture, generation after generation, continent after continent. It's not new at all. There's nothing more trite than progressivism. It's just the classic slippery slope of human depravity. It is the most predictable 
thing in the world. And at the very end of Romans chapter 1, Paul chastises even believers who approve of these things. This is shocking language, but again, Isaiah, as, as shocking as this is to see in the Bible, he has stopped drastically short of the kind of things that actually happened. All right? you, you went to the king with oil and multiplied your perfumes. You sent your envoys far away and sent them down even to Sheol. This is sort of the Old Testament version of hell. All right, every every all your offerings that you've made, all of uh, all of these acts of worship, uh, they, it's all gone straight to hell. You became weary on your many journeys, but you didn't say it's hopeless. Like you had numerous opportunities to turn back, but you continued down this idolatrous, murderous, lust laden trip of depravity. You found a renewal of your strength, therefore you did not grow weak. See, so this kind of evokes the language of Isaiah chapter forty. And all the while, they didn't remember God. They never turned around. Have you been kind of, have you been working your way down the slippery slope of sin and you know God, but you're continuing on anyway? Would you stop now? Would you repent? I've kept silent for a long time, haven't I? So you don't, you, you do not fear me. God had not spoken for a while. And so they said, oh, well, God's not watching me. And this is futile. God saw all of it. I will announce your righteousness. That sounds nice. No. No one's righteous, not even one. And your works. All right, if you're very proud of your own righteousness, watch out. They will not profit you. This is that reality check, uh, kind of drawing from the courtroom theme that we've seen. Uh, when you cry out, let your collection of idols rescue you. Man, uh, it's, so, it, it's so stunning. I've seen it over and over again. Um, people who get caught up in the LGBTQQIAAP plus revolution and they just adhere to uh, adhere to uh, all manner of sexual depravity, and then they go down the, the rabbit hole and they find themselves just really in ruin because of it. They don't go to leaders within that community. They can't. They're ostracized if they ever dare question the doctrine of it. So they come to pastors. Pastors know more about the fallout than the leaders of the LGBTQ community do because they can't go to you. You're not a safe space. Ironically, you're not tolerant. You're not open-minded enough. And as pastors, they, they come to us because they're like, look, I've tried this and it's ruining my life. How can I get right with God? And so we share the gospel and I've seen the Lord restore people. I've, I'm seeing it now in, in a personal evangelistic encounter. I, I, I see God giving people hope where, I mean, the devil's bait has wrought nothing but destruction upon their lives. In, in those moments, if you, if you, I mean, just bite down hard on the rusty hook within the bait of the sexual revolution and you careen down it all the while thinking yourself more spiritual, you're sort of like the idolaters uh, in, in Isaiah's day. And then when everything comes crashing down, those idols to whom you've given everything, you've sacrificed your children, they will do nothing to rescue you. The wind will carry all of them off. A breath will take them away. This is not a new thing. This is not a revolution. This is a reiteration of the same failed cultural plan of Sodom and Gomorrah, of ancient Greece, of ancient Rome. But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. So the text ends sort of as it began. It's, a, it's another callback to, do you remember these guys in the opening verses? The righteous who will enter into peace, rest on their beds, everyone who lives uprightly. If you want to be among those guys, then take refuge in the Lord. Confess every last one of your sins before God. Walk in repentance. It may not be celebrated in the dregs of the internet, but it is celebrated in heaven when a sinner repents. There's a beautiful church called the Redemption Church, and we are more than ecstatic for you to come and worship right alongside us because we have all sinned too. Believe me, all right? I've sinned. I've made some big, giant, stupid, boneheaded mistakes in my life. But the Lord's mercy and grace is new every single day. Come, abide in the grace offered by the Lord. And then, as this speaks to Old Testament inheritance of their, their promised land, you and I, as New Testament believers, we interpret this rightly through heaven above. I'll see you tomorrow.